All right, good morning, and um, I just want to welcome everybody this morning for another Sunday, another session, um, another time of fellowship, uh, and we just, we're grateful to God for His kindness towards us, His goodness towards us, His faithfulness towards us. Uh, we're grateful to God this morning for every mercy He's shown us, amen, because uh, He's always faithful, He's always good. He's ever present, and so just thank God this morning. Um, our message this morning is entitled "Watching Our Spiritual Health." Watching our spiritual health, and why is that message important? It's important because in uh, in, the, in the scriptures, Christ tells us to watch and pray so that we will not fall into temptation. To watch and pray so that we will not fall into temptation. There's two things there to watch and to pray so that we don't fall into temptation because the temptation in that passage refers to the weaknesses of the flesh and the flesh this morning i'm going to refer to means our carnal nature our sinful nature not the physical flesh itself but the <laughs> sinful nature of man so christ tells us very clearly in the word of god that we should watch and pray it's two things watch our hearts watch our lives and also pray so that we don't fall into temptation. So our message this morning is watching our spiritual health. And our reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 25. Galatians 5, 16 to 25. And what, what we want to deal with in our message this morning is a couple of things. We'll see that this message encourages us. Galatians 5, 16 to 25, we'll see when we read it, it encourages us. It petitions us to walk by the Spirit of God and not by our flesh. Again, the flesh refers to our carnal nature, our sinful nature, our human nature, our broken nature. So it encourages us to walk by the Spirit of God. To walk by the Spirit of God and not by our carnal nature. Because there is a tendency, and we'll see in the passage, for us to want to sometimes walk by the flesh and not by the spirit. Because the passage makes it clear that there is a struggle. There is a conflict between the two. Also what we want to deal with this morning is why must we walk by the spirit? So first of all, we want to see what it says about being encouraged to walk by the spirit. Secondly, why must we walk by the spirit? Why is it important to walk by the Spirit? Because there are consequences. Whichever we yield to, whether it's the Spirit of God or whether it's our sinful nature, our carnal nature, there is a consequence for both. Thirdly, I want to investigate and look at what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? What is the evidence of a life of a person who is walking by the Spirit of God? And what is the evidence of a person who is walking in accordance with their carnal nature? And fourthly and finally, we want to look at how do we walk by the Spirit? How do we walk by the Spirit of God? So we're going to read the passage this morning, Galatians 5, 16 to 25, and then we'll get into the message. Galatians 5, 16 to 25, it says, this is Paul speaking to the Galatians. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. And what? And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's the first instruction he gives us. Walk in the spirit and you, will, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the way to combat the desires of the flesh, very clearly there, is by walking in the spirit of God. By walking by the power of the spirit of God. By being in Christ and Christ being in us. Verse 17. For what? For the flesh. The flesh. Again, the flesh there refers not to the physical flesh. It's our carnal nature, our sinful nature, our broken nature. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh or what he's trying to say there is that the flesh and the spirit are in conflict with each other. 
The Spirit of God that is in us when we come to Christ wants us to do the things of God, but our human nature, our human nature still wants to pull us away from the things of God and fulfill the things of the flesh. And it says here that what, and these are contrary to each other. They are opposite to each other. The Spirit of God wants to lead us to life, wants to lead us to please God. But the, the flesh, the, the carnal nature, it's still struggling, it wants to pull us back to do the things that are contrary to the things of God. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Now, that verse there can go both ways. Because the, the spirit and the flesh are working against each other, it means that sometimes we want to do the things of God, but the flesh wants us to do the opposite to what is in line with the will of God. It also works the other way. Sometimes we want to follow our flesh, but because the spirit of God in us works contrary to the flesh, the spirit of God will not allow us to fulfill the sinful desires of the flesh. So both are correct in this context. Verse 18, it says here, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 19, now, the works of the flesh are evident. So now we're moving into the, 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 the portion where it shows us the evidence of what is really at work in the life of a person. Now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions or arguments or fightings, jealousies, outbursts of wrath or anger, selfish ambition, meaning me, myself, and I only, dissensions, heresies, when people move away from the established word of God and begin to establish their own doctrine, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as, just as I also told you in the times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we see there in verse 19 to 21, very clearly, the fruits of the flesh. We see there very clearly the evidence of a life that's under the influence of the carnal nature, the sinful nature. Fornication, sexual immorality, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, Outbursts of wrath, selfish, it goes on and on and on and on. And on. Basically, everything that is contrary and opposite to the ways of God and the will of God. Then verse 22, we now see the evidence of a life that is under the influence of the Spirit of God. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, meaning patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Verse 24. Now we move into how we can begin to deal with the struggles of the flesh. And it says in verse 24, it says here, <clears throat> and those who are Christ's, those who belong to Jesus, those who are in Jesus, have crucified the flesh, the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I'll go to verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So a few things that we see there, we see very clearly, first of all, that we are being strongly encouraged, from verse 16, to walk 
by the Spirit of God. To allow the Holy Spirit to do the work inside of us. Being strongly encouraged and even admonished. Verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Not stay, walk. Walk in the Spirit. It's a continuous process. Not to be stagnant, but to walk in the Spirit of God. It's an active process. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we're being encouraged there to live and to walk and to act and to allow the Spirit of God to do the work in us. Because if we don't walk by the Spirit, the, contra- the, the converse of this, uh, of this sentence is that if you don't walk by the Spirit, then you will fall and you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. So Paul gives us very clearly the, what, the, 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 the antidote. Because there is a struggle. And that's the second point. He says here in verse 17, For the flesh lusts lust or wars or is in, is in a struggle against the Spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. So the words being used there, it's more of a struggle, a fight, a conflict. And so we have to understand that at the end of the day, we have a choice to make. Thirdly, we read there the evidence of a life that is either under the spirit of God or a life that's being primarily driven by the flesh. So in that struggle, in that conflict, we have a choice. If we allow the Spirit, the Holy Spirit to do its work inside of us, you will see that our inner man is strengthened and the the fruits of the Spirit that we we read here, love and joy and peace and long-suffering, will begin to manifest in our spirit man and in our lives because we are allowing the Spirit of God to do the work in us. But in that struggle, if we decide to follow the flesh and allow ourselves to be subjected to the desires of the flesh, then what will begin to happen is that the fruits of the flesh will begin to manifest in our lives. And the thing we'll see this morning is that fruits don't lie. Fruits don't lie. If I walk up to an orange tree, I can tell by looking at the fruit of the tree that it is an orange tree. If I walk up to an apple tree, I can tell that it's an apple tree because the fruit will tell me what kind of what kind of trees it is. It's the same thing with our spiritual lives. The fruits don't lie. And that evidence of what kind of seed, what kind of um, authority we are allowing to govern our lives is manifest in the fruits and the evidence of how we live and how we walk. But the first one I want to make this morning is this. When we, when we give our lives to Jesus, when we come to Jesus, when we surrender to him as Lord and Savior, when we turn from our old ways and turn to Christ, it means that as the scriptures tell us that we become new creatures. We are new creatures. That is not a guess. That is not an assumption. That is a fact. We are new creatures. And how are we new creatures? How do we know we've come to Christ? We are new creatures because our desires are new. Our ambitions are new. Our inclinations are new. When we come to Christ, when we truly come to Jesus, what happens is that we want to now begin to live for God and not just for ourselves. The things that we used to do that displease God, we don't want to do those things anymore. We want to start to begin to live and please God. When we come to Christ, we realize that we want to pray more, we want to be in the, in the Word more. There's a, there's a hunger in our hearts that begins to rise for the things of God. That's what it means by saying that we are new creatures. And that's the evidence of the Spirit of God working inside of us. We said last week that what it is God who wills inside of us to will and to act in accordance to His good purpose. So he works within us to have the willingness and the desire to act for his good purpose. But then, even as the Holy Spirit is working inside of us, even as the Holy Spirit is changing us, transforming us, there's a different force at play. 
There is a different element at play. Our old sinful nature, our old broken nature, that part of a man that is rebellious to the things of God is still at work. It is still working. And what it wants to do is do something that is opposite to the will of God. So God says don't lie. But the flesh you try to justify, you must lie. God says don't bear false witness. But there will be times that the flesh will try and justify why you should bear false witness. The word of God is against sexual immorality, but the flesh wants to pull you in that direction. So there's two forces at play. You have the spirit of God working to transform a person who's come to Christ. But there's a struggle. And the flesh wants to do what is contrary to the will of God and to the plan of God and to the word of God. The difference though, and the good news is this. When we come to Jesus, it's great news. Because when we come to Christ, we are new creatures. Why? Because the power of sin in our lives is broken. The power of sin in our lives is broken. The power of God that is now working in us sets us free from the power of sin. Why do I say that? Because the things that we would have done before and not felt guilty about, now we have a struggle about doing those things. The things that we would have done before that we would not even thought about that were sinful, now we think twice before we do it. Because the power of God is working inside of us and transforming us and changing us. So Jesus, because we've come to Christ, we're new creatures in him, he breaks the power and hold of sin over our lives. So now we begin to struggle. We begin to struggle with things that are sinful that we did before without even thinking about. And that is sanctification. The Holy Spirit is now working inside of us, transforming us, sanctifying us, forming Christ in us. So the struggle is a good sign. The struggle is a good sign. The struggle is a sign that there is something that is working in you that is preventing you from falling into the ways of the flesh. There's something that is now working inside of us to make us want to please God. God. There's something that is inside of us that's trying to make us to walk in line with the ways of God that is forming us into Jesus this nature and character. But here's the thing. When you look at the world, when you look at the world around us, you see that the world is the way it is because many people who have rejected Christ, they have no struggle. There is no struggle. There is nothing to hinder the work of the flesh or the enemy in their lives. So lying is not a problem. Cheating is not a problem. Sexual immorality is not a problem. Perverting the ways of God and the word of God is not a problem. Because there's no spirit of God working in them to hold back those sinful things. So the struggle in the life of a believer is a good thing. When we should worry is when we stop struggling. When we stop struggling, when it becomes easier... To do the things that we know that God says we should not do. That is when we should actually begin to worry. Because it means that God is now pulling back. And giving that person over to their sinful desires. And we'll see that in the scriptures this morning. So the extent to which the spirit of God works in us. Depends on which side we choose to fall under its authority. And that's a fact. Whether we choose to walk by the Spirit of God, as Galatians 5 tells us, or whether we choose to give in to our sinful and carnal nature. But the point here is that we have a choice. We have a choice. We have a choice. Because the more we walk by the Spirit, the more our inner man is strengthened and the more our sinful nature is weakened. And the converse is the, truth, is, is the same. 
The more we walk by the flesh, the weaker our spirit man becomes because we are hindering the work of the Holy Spirit. And the stronger our flesh becomes. And we begin to manifest more of either the fruits of the spirit or the fruits of the flesh. Because you must understand it is not us. We are not the ones. It is not us. I want to make this clear. It is not us. We are not the ones who manifest the fruits of the, of the spirit. It's not us. It is not, it's this Holy Spirit at work in us, strengthening the spirit man in us that is manifesting the fruits of the spirit through us. It is not us. It's not our own effort. It is the yielding to the spirit of God to do his work. That is how we begin to manifest the fruits of the spirit in our lives. The natural fruit of the human nature are fruits of the flesh. But the more we yield to the flesh, the more we choose to ignore the leadings of the spirit, sadly what tends to happen is that the fruits of the flesh become evident in our lives. There is a struggle between the two, our two natures, our new nature in Christ and our old nature. But ultimately, like I said before, we have to choose which side we follow. And the truth is that whatever we feed more, whichever we focus on more, whichever we fall under its authority more, will become more dominant in our lives. And the more we yield to the Spirit of God, the more we allow Jesus to be formed in us, the more we become more like Christ, and the more we manifest the fruits of the Spirit. But the more we allow the, the flesh to control us, the more we fall under the leading of the flesh and ignore the spirit, the converse happens. The more we become like the world, the, more we, the less we become like Jesus. And both have consequences. Both have consequences. Let me use a simple analogy. If you take a healthy individual and an unhealthy individual, there are differences. The healthy individual eats properly. They drink a lot of water. They take care of their health. They avoid junk food. They exercise. So it's no surprise that they are healthy because their immune system is stronger and they're less susceptible to disease. Am I correct? But if you take an unhealthy individual, they eat whatever they want to eat, they, they don't take care of their body. They don't exercise. They don't drink a lot of water. So what happens? Their immune system becomes weak. So what you see in those situations is that whether you are healthy physically or unhealthy physically, it's 90% of the time, it's, it's not by accident. It's not, it's not by accident. It's, it's intentional and it's deliberate. And the result you get in either case is because of the decisions and the choices that were made. Another example. If you take the human body, what does it need to survive? It needs food. It needs water. It needs oxygen. If you deprive the human body of any of those three, that body will start to weaken and weaken and weaken and ultimately that body will die. That's a fact. We cannot argue with that. The physical body needs food, water, and oxygen. If you take one out of those equations, it will ultimately die. Just one. The same thing with our spirit man. The same thing with our inner man. Just as we have to take care of our physical bodies, we have to also focus and take care of our inner man, our spirit man. Just as the physical body needs food, our spirit man needs also food. That is the word of God. That's what the Bible says, man shall not what live by bread alone, by physical bread, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So as your physical body needs food, your spirit man also needs food, which is the word of God. As your body needs water 
to live. Your spirit man needs prayer to live. And as our spirit man needs oxygen to breathe and have life, our spirit man, as our physical man needs oxygen to breathe and have life, our spirit man needs faith to live. Because just as the body without these things will become weak and die, the truth is that, listen to me very carefully, the truth is that our spirit man, without feeding upon the word, without being a place of prayer, without walking by faith, the same will happen. It begins to get weak, very slowly, gradually. And ultimately, if we're not careful, we'll die. So the question that we have to ask ourselves this morning is this. I have to ask myself, and you have to ask yourself. The question is, if God had to place a spiritual mirror before us this morning, I want us to imagine this for a minute. There's a spiritual mirror that God places before us this morning. And that spiritual mirror reflects the condition of our inner man. What are we going to see? If God had to place a spiritual mirror before each and every one of us this morning, and that mirror doesn't just reflect how we look physically, but that mirror is a reflection of our inner man, our spirit man. What are we going to see? What does our spirit man look like? Because you must understand that before God sees us physically, what he is seeing first of all is that inner man, that spirit man. That's what he sees. As we said last week, the more Christ is formed in us, the more we yield to the power of the Holy Spirit, the stronger and the healthier our spirit man is. Because it is the Jesus, the work of Christ in us that God sees, not us. But if we had to look at this spiritual mirror today, what does our spirit man, our inner man, what does he look like? Is he healthy? Is he strong? Or is he weak? And is he dying? Slowly. Is our spirit man healthy and strong because we have yielded to the Holy Spirit? Is our spirit man healthy and strong because we are feeding on the word of God? Is he healthy and strong because you are steadfast in prayer? Are we in a place of prayer? Is our spirit man healthy and strong because we are walking by faith? Or is our spirit man slowly, slowly getting weak and dying? Because we are not in the world. We are neglecting our spirit man. We are allowing our spirit man to become weak because we are rejecting, we are ignoring, we are obstructing the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not force itself to do the work. God will put a prompting in our hearts. He'll, he'll push us. He'll nudge us. But he will never force us. There's a place where our own will, our own willingness to allow God to do the work. There's a place that we have. But the Holy Spirit will not force himself. He will not invade your life by force. He will prompt you gently. He will lead you gently. He will direct you gently. He will correct you gently. And the more we yield to that leading, the more our spirit man begins to become strengthened. 
and alive and rejuvenated. Ultimately, the life and the vitality of our inner man has everything to do with our connection with the Spirit of God in us and with us. If we yield to it, surrender to it, submit to it, our inner man is strengthened. If we choose to ignore it, if we choose to follow what our flesh is pushing us to do, if we choose to follow our own lust and desires. What will happen is that the voice of the Spirit becomes fainter and fainter and fainter and fainter until one day we will no longer hear the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Bible warns us about grieving the Spirit of God. It is a real thing. It is a real thing. And so we see the evidences of which authority, which force, which party the life of a person is under. Galatians 5, 19, Galatians 5, 19 23. We see that the works of the flesh are evident. You will see it. In fact, Jesus says, the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. If you don't look at what a person is saying, look at their lives. Look at, look at their lives. Look at, the, look, at, look at their actions. By their fruits you shall know them. So the works of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, the upwards of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. So when you see this in the life of a person, when you see this in a society, it is clear that it's a society or a person who is not functioning under the power of the Spirit of God. Or a person who has moved away from God. Or a person who is moving away from God. Now, let me make one thing clear. It doesn't mean that we're not going to struggle. That's not what I'm talking about here. But when this becomes the regular evidence in a person's life when there is no struggle to do these things anymore then you have to understand that that person is either moving away from God willfully or have moved away from God or don't know God and it says here by the way it says here uh, okay, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries and the like that 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 that, that word that that, that that sentence there, and the like, means basically every action, every behavior that is contrary to the word of God and the will of God. And the like. So he, he, he puts and the like there so that it covers everything. And the like. And as a warning, that those, you see, that those who practice, practice. So practice means to do something what? repeatedly. So I'm not talking about people who fail from time to time. We're going to struggle. We are human. We're going to make mistakes. Guaranteed. What, what Paul is talking about here is those who practice. They do it. They know it's wrong, but they do it. They know it's against the word of God, but they do it anyway. That's what practice means. To do something repeatedly. Those who practice such Things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it's like when the Holy Spirit says, don't do this, but they choose to ignore and go against. If the word of God says, don't commit sexual immorality, and they choose to ignore, but do it repeatedly. That's where the warning comes in here that such will not inherit the kingdom of God. God is a gentleman. He's not going to shout and scream and threaten. No. The Spirit of God, it will nudge us. It will treat us gently with love and affection and compassion. 
God's Spirit will, will, will speak to us quietly. But we have a decision to make either to listen to it or to ignore it. And when we read from verse 22, we see the fruits of the Spirit. Also evident. There's love. There's a, there's a love in, within the person. There is joy. The joy of the Lord is their strength. There's peace. There's a sense of peace in their lives. There's long suffering. They are patient. There's kindness. They are good. There's goodness. There's faithfulness. There's gentleness. There's self control. Against such there is no law. Meaning that they are allowing the Spirit of God to do the work in them and they are in right standing with God. But I want you to understand here that it says fruit. I was using my son this morning and I explained to him this concept. We have to be very careful. It says fruit. Because there is a process that happens in the physical world. The same happens in our spiritual life. And why does it say fruit? The word there, fruit, it signifies a process. There is a, there is a process of growth that has to take place. You, don't, you just don't see a tree magically appear by itself with the fruit. No, there is a process. And the first process is the seed has to first go into the ground, in the soil. That's the first process. And it has to be the right seed in that soil. So the first step is that the seed has to grow in that soil and then what happens? That seed has to be watered, has to be taken care of, it needs air and sunlight and water and gradually it begins to grow. And that seed under the right conditions begins to grow gradually, gradually, gradually. The fruit starts small, slowly, eventually they become big and ripe. So there's a process. And that process in our spiritual life is the same thing. God plants that seed in our hearts and our lives by the Spirit of God. And that Spirit of God, if we allow Him to do the work, begins to transform us like that plant that grows into a tree that has the fruit. And that process starts to change us, transform us into like the character of Christ. And then the fruits even though they might start off small at first, begins to get bigger, more evident, more obvious. And then people will see us and say, no, so, so and so, they have the nature of Jesus. That person has the character of Jesus. There's something different about that person. They must be Christian. They must be a believer. Because it's now evident. And the point here is, it's not just what they do on the outside. There is a genuine transformation inside of them taking place. So it's a process. But we have to allow the seed to have the right conditions. We have to allow the seed to grow. And how do we allow that? By yielding to the work of the Spirit of God. By yielding to the prompting of the Spirit of God. But if I take that same seed that's inside. And I take a stone and I put it on top of that soil where the seed is. It will never grow. The seed is there. The seed is, in, the seed is there. But if I now take a stone and I put it on the soil where that seed is, that seed will never grow. And that stone basically signifies our reluctance to be obedient to the word of God. That stone signifies our reluctance to be led by the Spirit of God. That stone signifies our willingness to follow the flesh and not the leading of the Spirit. So even though God has put that, that seed in there, if we now of our own willfulness now put that stone on top, it will never grow. So what are the consequences? There are consequences. We 
whichever we choose to yield to, there are consequences. When we read Galatians 6, 8, what does it say to us? Galatians 6, in fact, before we go to Galatians 6, 8, let's go back to Galatians 5. Galatians 5, 21 saying, I tell you beforehand, just as I told you also in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's clear. That's the first consequence. Galatians 6, 8, it says to us, Let's start from verse 7. Do not be mocked. Sorry, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Why? For whatever a man sows. That is very interesting. Whatever a man sows, meaning whatever you put in the ground, whatever seed you allow to take root in your life or your heart, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. That is a fundamental physical law. It's a fundamental spiritual law. It will not change. It is impossible for us to put in an apple seed and get a mango tree. It is impossible. Impossible. Whatever you sow, you are going to reap. It's a fundamental physical law. It's also a fundamental spiritual law. So don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh, again, he who sows to his flesh, he who surrenders to his carnal nature, he who surrenders to his sinful nature, he who surrenders to the desires of the flesh. What's going to happen? Will of the flesh reap corruption? But he who sows to the Spirit, that is the person who allows himself to be led by the Spirit of God, who choose to let the Holy Spirit do the work in their lives, who listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit, who feed upon the Word of God, who are in a place of prayer, who allow themselves to walk by faith. He says what? But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So there's a, con there's a clear consequence. There's a clear consequence. He who sows to his flesh, who surrenders to the flesh, to the sinful nature, will reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So there's a consequence there. Is life or destruction? Romans 8 8. Is it Romans 8 8 as well? Romans 8 8. Very similar thing. We see the consequence. Of either walking by the spirit or walking by the flesh. Romans, in fact, I'm going to start from Romans um, 8 5. Let's go to uh, verse 5 first. Romans 8 5. It says here, For those who live according to the flesh, they do what? They set their minds on the things of the flesh. So their minds, they live in accordance with the flesh because their minds are the things of the flesh. Their mind is the, is the, is the things of, of, of their, their own desires, their own ambitions, their own feelings, the things of the world. To set your mind means that that's your focus. That is what you fill your mind with, you fill your life with, and so it drives you. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, right, they set their minds on the things of the spirit. And how do we do that? Again, feeding on the word. Being in prayer. Walking by faith. Applying the truth of God's word in our lives. That is how we set our mind 
The Bible says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our mind is only renewed through the word of God. When we renew our mind, just take a step back. When we renew our mind, you know what it's like? It's like having a garden. Like having a garden. Renewing your mind is like having a garden where you actually go to that garden and you begin to uproot the weeds. You up, take off the weeds. Take out the weeds. And then you plant a nice fresh plant, fresh seed in that garden. That is what renewing your mind is. That, that's what the Word of God does. When we read the Word of God, it begins to cut out and remove the weeds in our spiritual life. It begins to remove and extract and rip out the weeds in our spiritual life. It begins to put in that in place the proper healthy seeds and plants. That's what it means to renew our minds. We renew our minds through the Word of God, through a place of prayer, and walking by faith and applying that word. But if you don't renew your mind with the word of God, what will happen is that those weeds will grow naturally by themselves. Those weeds will just grow, and we, I'm going through it right now, even in my own garden. Those weeds will just grow naturally, and they will grow wildly, uncontrollably. Because there is nothing, there is nothing to hinder those weeds. So we have to renew our mind with the word. Otherwise we have different, different weeds who, who grow. And that's, those weeds signify the works of the flesh. Because we don't have the, the word of God holding back, pushing back, ripping those things out, changing us. So we have weeds that grow. So it says here that those who live according to the flesh, that is, they are practicing the things of the flesh, they are doing it repeatedly because that their minds are set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit of God, their minds are set on the things of the Spirit of God. And here's another warning, verse 6. But to be carnally minded... To be carnally minded, to be fleshly minded, to be following and practicing the ways of the flesh, to have our minds set on the things of the flesh, says to be carnally minded is death. Remember what I said before. If we deny our spirit the things it needs, it will become weak slowly. And die. That death signifies to be blind to the things of God, to be deaf to the voice of God, to be hardened to the leadings of God. That's what I mean. And if that persists, it leads to spiritual death eternally. For to be carnally minded, to decide that I'm going to focus my mind, I'm going to obey. The things of the flesh. I'm going to follow how my flesh feels. I'm going to turn my back to what the word of God says. I'm going to follow my, de my own desires, my own ways. I'm going to do what God tells me not to do repeatedly. I'm going to practice it. It says here to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So what happens is that the more of what we yield to has an influence has an influence in our inner man one of the scariest things I've seen recently is to witness people 
who used to be believers. People who used to follow Christ, who used to profess Jesus, who used to go to church, be in prayer, read the word. What I'm witnessing increasingly, and it's very, very frightening, is to see when the same person, when they turn from God and they become atheistical in their thinking, when they reject God, and I'm seeing it increasingly on, on social media, you will see people that used to be believers. They used to go to church. They used to pray. They used to be in the Word. But somewhere along the line, something began to happen. Somewhere along the line, they began to allow themselves to walk in accordance to the flesh. Somewhere along the line, they began to decide not to listen to the leadings of the Spirit of God. And you know what began to happen? Gradually, 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 they heard less and less and less clearly the voice of God. Gradually, 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 the light of the Spirit of God in their hearts and their lives began to dim. Gradually, 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 a heart that was sensitive to the things of God began to become hardened and hardened and hardened to the point that when the same people they speak about the things of God with hatred. This is a fact. It's not, it's not conjecture. It is a fact. I have seen it with my own eyes. And that's why it says here, for those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. I witnessed these people, something inside of them has died. It's dead, it's gone. The Spirit of God has withdrawn itself. And now all they are left with is a hatred for the things of God. And what they now do on social media is now their mission is to get other people to turn their backs on God. Now they are being instruments that Satan is using to turn others away from God. We must be careful. It didn't happen overnight with these people. It happened gradually. That's why Jesus says what? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Not just watch. Watch and pray. So that you will not fall into temptation. And you know the scary thing about that condition we see in Hebrews 10, when people end up in that condition, it is a very, very frightening condition. And Hebrews 10 tells us, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10 tells us and warns us the condition of such people. When they go from following Jesus, when they go from trusting in Jesus to actually now rejecting Jesus, it happens gradually, not overnight. Somewhere along the line, they decide to put a stone on that seed. Somewhere along the line, they decided, no, I'm not going to walk in line with the Spirit of God. I'm now going to walk opposite the Spirit of God. And God says, you know what? You made the decision. And now they are now militant. They are militant in their hatred for the things of God and their desire. Now they are instruments in the hands of Satan. Being used to drive so many away from God to hell. Hebrews 10.26 It says to us, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth. There is no longer remaining a sacrifice for sins. Let me just stop there for a second. So if we sin willfully, now I'm not talking about the fact that we fall and fail from time to time. That's not what this verse is referring to. It is people who have decided in their hearts that they are going to reject and rebel 
against the things of God. They have decided, I'm not going to be in the world. I'm not going to pray. I'm going to follow my own desires, how I feel. I'm going to feed my flesh, not my spirit. So he says, but if we sin willfully, that word willfully here is the same thing as we read in Galatians for those who practice. If we sin willfully, it's the same as those who practice. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, that is Christ. That is Jesus. So these people have now decided they've received the knowledge of the truth. They've had Christ. They've been, they, they, they've been told about salvation. They know the way of salvation. But now something has happened. They've now chosen to sin willfully after they have received the knowledge of the truth. This is not about people who were, did not know Jesus. These are people who had received the truth. He says here what? There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Because Christ has finished the work. He has done the work. So if that person was, was, was following Christ, and at some point they decide to turn away, and practice, and fulfill, and be led by the flesh and not the spirit, it is very clear here, it says here, there is no longer remaining a sacrifice for sins. Because Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice. But what? But a fearful, but, but, but a certain, that word there certain means it's assured. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. So that person has now decided that they are no longer with Christ. The word says, if you are not with me, you are against me. So now they are now an adversary. That's why I said before, there are now people, they are being used by the enemy. Militantly. They used to claim to know Jesus, but now they are being used by the enemy militantly on social media to drive others away. Because the enemy is the adversary. By rejecting Jesus, they have now allowed the spirit of the adversary to use them. And the word says here, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain, 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 assured, you can take that to the bank. It is, it is guaranteed. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fire indignation which will devour the adversaries. Verse 28. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Verse 29. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who trampled the Son of God on the foot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. He is referring there to people who experience salvation. But by choosing to be obedient to the flesh and not the spirit, by choosing not to walk in line with the spirit but the flesh, by choosing to practice the things of the, of the flesh and not the spirit, they insulted the spirit of grace. He's not talking about people who never came to Jesus. He's talking about people who did not watch him pray. How much more worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God on the foot? They've trampled the work of Jesus underneath their feet. They've wiped their feet with the blood of Christ, the, the precious blood he sacrificed on the cross to save them. And insulted the spirit of grace. But we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. He is referring to those that used to follow Jesus, but they turned back. The lust of the world was too strong. 
The lust of the flesh was too strong. The desires of the flesh was too strong. They did not watch, they did not pray. They did not allow the Spirit of God to do the work inside of them. The spirit man weakened slowly, slowly, slowly until they came to a point of spiritual death where they could no longer hear the word of God. The light of Christ was dim in their hearts. And their hearts were hardened. Verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The word of God tells us these things. Not to frighten us. But to keep us in line with the will of God. God's desire for us are good desires. God's desires for us is full of kindness and compassion. And so the word of God is like a map to lead us away from where the destruction is and lead us to life. That's why the word is there. Not to frighten us, not to scare us, but no. To make us to shine the light of God's word in our own hearts. Like I said before, to put that mirror, that spiritual mirror before us and say, what does my spirit man look like? What does my inner man look like? Is it being strengthened by the spirit of God? Or is it being weakened by the, by the power of the flesh? Because God sees the spirit man before he sees the physical man. I want to make the point again that it is not that we will not struggle. We are not going to not struggle. The point here is that fruits don't lie. Fruits don't lie. And we have to really come to a point where we surrender and be sensitive to the gentle voice of the Holy Spirit, where we yield ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit, where we allow the Word of God to renew our minds, like the weeds I spoke about. When the Word of God is transforming us, it begins to uproot those weeds, those things of the flesh, begin to plant the things of God, begin to rearrange and re re reform the landscape of our hearts. But if the word of God is not being allowed to do the work, if we are putting that stone and obstructing the work of the Holy Spirit, those weeds will grow. The results will show. So as we begin to round up, remember the word of God is meant to guide us, to help us, to enlighten us. It is light and life, as I always say. And all that we need is here. If we allow God to reveal it to us, all we need is here. All we need is here. So how do we walk in victory? How do we walk in victory? We look at Galatians 5.25. Paul gives us an indication. Galatians 5.25. In fact, let's start from Galatians 5.16. We walk in victory when it says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walking, like I said in the beginning, it's an active thing. It's a daily thing. It's a moment by moment thing. It's a day by day thing. If you are walking in the spirit, if you are feeding your spirit, if you are allowing the Holy Spirit to begin to do the work, am I in prayer? 
Am I in the word? Am I applying the word into my life? Am I walking by faith? Am I believing the word of God? Am I applying the word of God? Am I trusting the word of God? That's how we work by the spirit. That's how we are transformed and our mind is renewed. So it says, walk by the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In verse 25, he says, if we live in the spirit, if we live in the spirit, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit, to abide in the spirit. It means a complete break the old way of life. It means godly repentance, godly sorrow. It means completely turning, making that decision to turn from our old way of life and to choose to live under the power of God. It means to deny ourselves daily and take up our cross. Because a true believer, let me tell you who a true believer is. A true believer is not someone who doesn't struggle. A true believer is somebody who chooses to crucify their sinful nature daily. They know there's a struggle. They know there's a war. They know there's a battle. But they also know that they are more than victorious through Christ. But they make the choice every day to crucify that flesh. They make a choice every day. They know where their sin belongs. They know that their sin belongs, what? On the cross. They know that their sins belong on the cross. Verse 24 says here in Galatians 5, 24, and those who are Christ's, those who are Christ, those who belong to Jesus, those who are in Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So when I walk, I, I know that my sins are crucified on that cross. My sins are nailed to that cross. But I have to walk in that reality. Not just think about it. I have to walk in that reality. So when the lust of the flesh comes, I have to remind myself that my sins are nailed on that cross. My sins belong on that cross. If you look at Luke 9, 23, Jesus says something very interesting. He says what? That you take up your cross daily. Daily. It means we have to crucify the flesh daily. We have to remember as we are led to sin or to fall and to fail. That no, this sin has been nailed to the cross. The struggle has been nailed to the cross. So we crucify the flesh. Secondly, we walk in victory by putting on Christ. We put on Christ. And we see that in Romans 13, 14. Romans 13, 14, it tells us that, in fact, let me just go back to 11. It says in verse, from verse 11, Romans 13, 11, it says, and do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. He's referring to the return of Christ. The last days. I want to make that point again. If Paul is saying here, thousand years ago that the night is fast spent and the day is at hand how close are we now 
How close are we now? Now, how close are we? How near are we? So he's saying that the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. That is the works of the flesh. Cast it off. Cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry and drunkenness. Not in lewdness and lust. Not in strife and envy. What do those remind us of? What? The fruits of the flesh. They're already in Galatians 5. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. We put on Christ. We put on Christ. We live in accordance to his word, his ways. We apply his truth in our lives. We pray that God will form Jesus in us. That's how we put on Christ. We abide in him, in faith. And him in us. That is the only way. He says, put on the Lord Jesus. Put him on. Put him on. Let him come for you. When people see, when they see you, they must see Christ. That's what I say, put him on. Let him so fill you that your, 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 inner, your inner man is so strengthened that it is reflected in your outward man. That the fruits of the Spirit are manifest in your life. When people see you, they see Christ in you. Because it's clear, he's saying here, yeah, it is high time. We are close. Nobody knows the day or the hour, but he's saying, back then he's saying, we, we says, he says, it is high time. So our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is fast spent, the day is at hand. That was thousands of years ago. How much closer are we now? So we crucify the flesh by walking in the truth of God. By remembering that our sins, our flesh is crucified on the cross. By remembering that we walk by the power of the Spirit of God. By remembering that Christ has broken the power of sin over our lives. By remembering that Christ has been formed in us. We walk in that truth, but if we don't know that truth, we will walk in accordance with the flesh. We walk in victory by putting on Jesus. We live out his word. We walk his word. We work out his word in our lives. We listen to the leading of the spirit of God. The spirit of God is gentle. It will nudge you. It will push you gently. It will work with you with compassion and gentleness and love. It will not force you. But the more you yield to the spirit of God and the leading of God, the more Christ is formed the more we are putting on Christ and the more his nature begins to be reflected in us to the world around us. How do we walk in victory? We walk in victory by what we set our minds upon. We walk in victory by what we set our minds upon. And we read that just now in Romans 8, 5. It says to us, for those who live according to the flesh, what happens? They set their minds to the things of the flesh. To set your mind means that that's your, your primary focus your primary attention, where you put your most energy to, where you put your most effort to, what controls your condition of your mind the most is, a, is the carnal nature, the human nature. That is what it means to what to set your mind on the things of the flesh. 
So it's no surprise if, if we sow the seeds to the flesh, then we must understand that the, the fruits that we will, we're going to reap will be the fruits of the flesh. But it says here that what? But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So what we allow into our minds, what we permit into our lives, what we fill our lives with, our minds with, that's the seed that will develop into a fruit. That's a fact. That's what the Bible says, what God is not mocked. A man will reap what he sows. So we have to be intentional and deliberate about what we allow, the seeds we allow to be planted in our hearts and our minds. They will either become fruits that will honor God and glorify God and draw us closer to God and make us more like Christ and we'll see that evidence in the fruit or they will conform us more in the likeness of our carnal nature. They will conform us more in the likeness of the world. They will make us less like Christ. The Bible says those who sow to what feed the flesh will reap corruption. But those who sought to please the Spirit will reap eternal life. The fruit is the evidence of the seed that we have allowed to take root in our hearts. We have to be intentional. We have to be deliberate. So whatever we are allowing in will at the end of the day manifest in one way or the other as fruit in our lives. So the question is this. If the seed, if the seed that we are planting is the word of God, if the seed that we are allowing to take root, to take root is the word of God. When I say, when I say take root, I mean if we, if, we are, if we are truly in the word and we allow the word to sink in our hearts and we apply that truth in our lives and we give that seed the right condition, that seed begins to germinate and grow. If the seed that we are allowing in our, in, our, in, our, in our hearts, that we are allowing to take root, is one of being in the prayer closet, spending time with God, meditating upon his direction, upon his word, it will begin to take root. If the seed that we are allowing is that we are applying, not just reading, but applying this truth in our lives by faith, by faith, it will begin to germinate and produce a seed. So what we allow, the evidence will be manifest in the fruits that we produce. The evidence does not lie. But on the converse, if the seed that we allow are the things of this world, the things what we see also will be the same fruit, the fruit of the flesh. So I have to look at the fruit in my life. I have to look at the fruit in my life. So as you. What does my fruit say? What does my fruit reflect? Does my fruit reflect the workings of the Spirit of God in my life? Or is it showing the working of the flesh in my life? But we have to understand that at the end of the day, that the Holy Spirit is there to help us. If I say today, Lord, I know my struggles, Lord, I know my challenges. Lord, I know where I'm being disobedient, where I'm being rebellious. If I cry out today and I say, Father, help me. Help me, strengthen my inner man. Help me to yield to your Holy Spirit, to the work in my life. God is going to do the work. But if I allow the word to come in here, and go out there. If I allow the word just skim over my brain and go away. 
if I allow myself to be hardened to the plea of the Spirit. Jesus says, what well, I stand. What? And knock. If you hear, let me in. But if I hear that gentle knock and I still decide to keep the door closed, God will not kick the door down. And finally, in closing, Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, Matthew 26, 41. Matthew 26, 41, when he's in the garden, his disciples are falling asleep. His time and hour is about to come. And he's praying. And uh, he goes and sees the disciples um, sleeping while he's praying. In his hour, Christ is crying out to the Father, pouring out his heart to the Father. And the greatest hour where the disciples could be awake, standing with Christ in prayer, they were sleeping. They were overcome by the weakness of the flesh. The spirit man would have been prompting them to pray to Christ, but their flesh was saying sleep. Matthew 26, starting from 40, he said, Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and said to Peter, What? So Christ is like, People, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? This is, this, is, this is the time preceding probably the greatest hour. He's about to go to the cross. He's in prayer with the Father. He's communing with God. And he comes back and he finds him asleep. He says, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Could you not stay awake one hour? Verse 41. Watch and pray, lest you enter temptation. Watch and pray. Watch. Watch the heart. Watch your life. Watch your inner man. And pray for strength. Pray for the Spirit of God to do the work. Pray for God to empower you. Pray for Him to equip you. Watch and pray, lest you enter temptation. What that means, basically, is that if you are not watching and you are not praying, you will, guaranteed, enter temptation. If we are not in a place of watchfulness, and allowing the word of God to shine its light on our hearts and say, Lord, watch, where am I missing? What am I doing wrong? Where am I not aligned to your way? If we're not watching, if we're not praying, what it's saying here basically is that we will fall into temptation. Then he goes on to say, the spirit, the spirit indeed, the spirit in you indeed is willing the spirit indeed, the spirit inside of us wants to glorify God, wants to do the things that please God, wants to draw us closer to God. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. We have to watch our lives. We have to be in a place of communion with God constantly. We have to pray that God will empower us. And that's why Jesus gave us his spirit. 
because on our own we cannot do it. In closing, our spiritual health matters. Our spiritual health matters. And one of the most dangerous things we can do as believers is to walk under assumption. Is to think that everything's okay, everything's fine, and carry on. But we are warned, we are encouraged to watch. Because it tells in the scriptures what? Be careful. If you think you stand, lest you fall. So we don't do it in brokenness. We do it in humility. We come to God and say, Father, search my heart. Lord, search my life. If you read the Puritans, and I recommend that we all do, the fathers of faith, read the Puritans. One of the things that they will advise that believers do from time to time, set your heart before the Lord. Set that spiritual mirror before you, honestly, openly. Ask God to reveal the condition of the inner man. Whatever the Spirit reveals, remember it reveals out of love and compassion. And then ask God to give the strength to strengthen that inner man. You must watch and pray. Let's pray.